Okay, so chapter 10 of Outwitting the Devil is so, so important that I had to share it on Facebook and YouTube. Not just for my Patreon. Self-discipline. Here we go. Yo, hey, what's up everybody? How you doing? This is your coach, Renz, and I know I had promised my patrons that chapter 10, self-discipline, the second of the seven principles needed by Napoleon Hill in order to be able to outwit the devil, to break that habit of hypnotic rhythm, to be able to be one of the 2% and not the, the 98% that is captured by the devil. I know I promised that was going to be just for my patrons. But this chapter has some elements and even though all chapters have some elements that are vital, this chapter has some elements that are so vital that I just had to share it with everybody. And I hope that if you are a supporter of this channel that you would go over to Patreon and become a supporter over there, show your love. So we're gonna go ahead and get with chapter 10. There's a lot of information here. I'm gonna summarize a lot of it because I wanna keep the, vo the, the, the video down, but you will definitely get the point. The So we know that the first the first characteristic, the first principle that you need to understand was definiteness of purpose. You have to have a definiteness of purpose. But the second part, you can't have definiteness of purpose without self-discipline. Without self-discipline, without the mastery of self. He even starts it out that way. Um, he says, um, the devil says that one must gain mastery over self, over, over self. This is the second of the seven principles. The person who is not a master of himself can never master others. Lack of self-mastery is, of itself, the most destructive form of indefiniteness. So you see, you can't have indefiniteness, you can't have a definiteness of purpose if you don't have self-mastery. And he says that although there are many different things about the self you need to master, there are three appetites that you must master. And that's where we're gonna concentrate, especially on the first two. You have to master these first. And then the others will be auxiliary. The others will be much easier to master. So the first, the, those three appetites that you must master first is the, um, the, the, the desire for food, the desire for expression of sex, and the desire for expressing loosely organized opinions. Now I know a lot of people just got thrown off with that one because in my comments, I constantly see loosely organized opinions that people believe are very well thought out and organized opinions. But, so let's go with this one. Mastery over the desire of food. You may think, why is that one so important? Here's the thing about it. And all these things are natural. They're natural appetites for you to have, natural things for you to want to express and want to take, take, take for yourself because food is something that you need. You need food in order to fuel yourself. But it is the idea of controlling your food. When I look around and I see people every day walking in and out of this mall, walking in and out of life period, what do I see is people who, haven't, can, who have not formed a mastery over their food. And it's not just by their weight, but it's also by their condition. He talks about it's not only what you eat, but the combinations of things that you eat together that in itself is an entire, entirely different video where we talk about nutrition and we'll, we'll do that one. What kind of food combinations you should have. As an adult, as an adult, once you pass a certain age, you should not be drinking milk. You shouldn't have any dairy for that part. And if you do, it should be minor, like a scoop of ice cream, not a gallon, not a pint, but a scoop. Cream in your coffee, that's it. But if you can eliminate dairy, period, you should. Why? Because dairy creates mucus in your joints. Mucus, if your body's alkaline, if you have mucus in your joints, then the virus can live in the mucus. You can, you, that's why you will be healthy for four, five, six years. But then you get sick one day. Mucus have been holding on to viruses. Viruses are able to live in, your, in, in the mucus. So no adult should have dairy. So coffee is good but coffee combined with the dairy, not as well, not as good. I'm a victim of that. But it is the combination. When I was a personal trainer, um, I would tell my clients, if you, if you do eat meat, the meat should be no more than the palm of your hand. The palm, not the fingers, just the palm. And then you should have two to four cups of vegetables, fruits and vegetables, and only one cup of starch. 
You see, fruits and vegetables and starches are carbohydrates. Your body loves carbohydrates. Your body needs carbohydrates. It prefers to burn carbohydrates. But the fruits and vegetables are your simple carbs. They burn faster. They're like the igniter to the fire. The complex carbohydrates are your long-term burning fuel. But you know if you have too much, then your carbohydrates will easily be stored as fat. Protein is more likely to be pushed out of your, your intestinal system. And he goes into great lengths to talk about the intestinal system. But the combination of those foods can either create a clean environment or a toxic environment. You know that if, you're, if each one of your meals incorporates two to four cups of fruits and vegetables, then you're more likely to go to the bathroom and evacuate your, your intestinal tract two, three, four times a day. But when you're filled with starches and it's filled with proteins, then you're, you develop constipation. And that constipation creates toxins in your body. You're walking around like a sewer, worse than a sewer. You're walking around with enough toxins in your system that if it was put in someone's bloodstream, you would kill a hundred people. He goes into the length of actually saying that. That if you, that the amount of toxins in a person would kill a hundred people if injected into their bloodstream. That's how toxic most people who are walking around bodies are today. And of course there are people on the other extreme. Those who don't eat enough, those who don't take in enough nutrients, those who are so restricted. You know, in the teachings of Buddha, in the story, Buddha leaves the, his Hindu life, he leaves his princely life where he enjoyed all the richness of life, all the richness of food. And then he left that richness of food and he, he, he became an ascetic where he deprived himself to the point where he was emaciated. The other ascetics thought that he was going too far. He went too far to the left. Whereas a prince, he was too far to the right, to the right. And as an ascetic, he was too far to the left, all seeking wisdom and creator. It wasn't until a little girl fed him under the Bodhi tree that he realized that there was a balance, a balance. And the actual Buddha, the actual Siddhartha, when he reached the Buddha mind, the Buddha head, because Buddha is a title, he actually found balance. And that's in your food, you have to find balance. A balance of food that, that incorporates a good flow of your intestinal tract. Many of your sicknesses are due because your intestinal tract is polluted. And that toxin is killing the rest of your body. Now, you may ask, why is that so important? He says that without that, that you wouldn't be able to move with a definiteness of purpose, that your body becomes sluggish, that your mind becomes sluggish, that you find yourself not able to, to participate in life in a way with a sharpness of mind and a sharpness of will. You will, you'll be laggard, you'll procrastinate, you'll develop all these outwardly habits based on the fact that you're poisoned, your body is rotten and poisoned. So, being able to understand how you need to manage your diet, manage your food, how you need to be able to restrain yourself from having all these tasty foods mixed in together. It's kind of like, uh, I have some bad habits. Well, they're not bad, I have some habits. <laughs> that I, and they're not real habits, I have some, some likes. Cigar bar, I like going to a cigar bar. I was at the cigar bar recently and um, three of my friends were there. Two of my friends were drinking and they mix white liquor and brown liquor. And if anybody who drinks knows, you do not mix brown liquor and white liquor. You will feel the pain of that later. And it's more immediate, so that's why people don't do it. Food intoxication is not as immediate. It's slow. It creeps up on you. It, 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 and that's the, the, that's the funny part about it. Is that it comes upon you so slow that you don't even recognize it which is why they don't have to come out and say, we're poisoning you. This is why when um, the guy did the video, the, the documentary of eating McDonald's third, for 30 days straight, that was an immediate offense to his system because he ate it and he indulged in it to a degree that most people don't. But when you consume it slower, you consume fast food slower, you don't notice it, you go up one size a year, you don't notice it, you have more and more arthritic pain, you don't notice it, you, these things slowly move, you, you blame it on age, you blame it on lack of movement, it, it, it creeps on you slowly. But if you take the drastic change of changing your diet, of understanding correct food combinations, and what I just told you is correct enough. If you eat meat, palm of your hand, two, cup, two to four cups of fruits and vegetables, 
and one cup of a starch for three meals. You're good. That's a good combination. Then other than that, you just need to learn how certain fruits and vegetables work, with, work better with each other. How certain starches work better with certain fruits and vegetables. They work better, okay? So you must control your food. You must control that desire for it. It'll, and you'll find yourself in a much healthier state. Right? The next one, and probably the most damaging one that if people don't gain control over, is where they lose themselves. And that is the desire for sex expression. He actually says, um, the desire for sex expression, now there is a force with which I master the weak and the strong, the old and the young, the ignorant and the wise. In fact, I master all who neglect to master sex. That's what the devil says. Now, if you looked at my video yesterday, if you haven't, go back and look at it. Stop, pause right now. Go back and look at the one pre prior to this one where I talked about relationships and love, how love can be your friend or your enemy. The thing about it is, within the sexual expression, you find love or lust. This is why it can master the powerful and the weak, the old and the young, the ignorant and the wise, because of the emotion that is attached to it. The emotion of, the emotion of love and the emotion of sexual expression are tied in with one another. Now, for some people, they can separate, they can compartmentalize, but for most, it's tied in, even if it's tied in a little bit. All it needs is a grain, all it needs is a small amount. If it's tied in, then that can cause you to be in the most destructive state you've ever been in, that you can be controlled by so many other sources. This is not something easy to master. I've been studying Tantra since, mm, since 1997 hardcore, initially introduced around 92, but 97 hardcore study of Tantra it has only been in the recent years that I would say that mastery over my sexual expression has gained a level that I know that it doesn't control me anymore. Every now and then do I sometimes have thoughts that slip up? Sure. But only in recent years have I, I will claim that I've mastered it, guru it. And we're talking about 20 plus years, almost 20, 20 plus years of study, of, of trying of trying, of engaging, of working on it. It is not the easiest thing. It would have been far easier if I had utilized it, taught it, if I was taught it as I taught my children. I taught my children about sex expression from when it was from four, five, six, seven, at the levels that they could understand. And I kept teaching them about sexual expression because I knew, even though I was still working it myself, I knew the damage. And if I can get them in that understanding at a young age, they wouldn't have to suffer through all the time. Wouldn't have to listen to all the different things that I was told about sex expression, about the machismo of it, about the manliness of it all, about the lustful parts of it, but understanding the control over it. Those are things that only over the last few years. Now I highlighted a bunch of things when it comes to this one. Uh, he, Napoleon asked, how can one master the emotion of sex? The devil says, by the simple process of transmuting the emotion into some some form of activity other than copulation. Sex is one of the greatest of all forces which motivates human beings. Because of this fact, it is also one of the most dangerous forces. Um, that is, and, and basically he says that if a person were to spend as much time working on themselves or on their work, on their career, on their finances, on their health, as they spend on their sex emotion, that the, as they spend on, on the pursuit of sex, that they would, they would never know poverty. They would never know poverty. How many 20 year olds, 30 year olds, spend so much time clubbing and trying to meet somebody to have sex with? How many times spend on, how much time they spend online? When if they spent that time working on their business, working on their finances, they would never know poverty. Working on increasing their skills, their ability to, to earn. These are things we'll talk about when we do, um, we're gonna start doing the richest man in Babylon uh, this week as well on Patreon as well as Facebook and YouTube. But if they, if they spent more time on that, as much time on that as they spent pursuing sex, then they would never know poverty. And because they would never know poverty, then they would also have, and they would have that self-discipline, then they would have self-discipline over their sexual expressions, over their emotion of sex, because then the sexual emotion, the energy, will be transmuted into their work. And then as they develop in their work and develop their mind, 
when the opportunity for sex expression comes, they won't just indulge in it. They'll actually have more control over who, when, where, why, how. They have more control over that to be able to express it in such a way that benefits them and their partner, not so much being damaging as lust does for people. So he goes very deep into that, but we, we, we will continue to go deep in that. Um, Napoleon Hill is shocked by this. He said there is a relationship between sex and poverty. He says, yes, where sex is not under definite control, it allows, and if allowed to run its natural course, sex will quickly lead into the habit of drifting. Um, he says there's uh, con a connection between sex and leadership. Now, I want you to hear this part. He said, yes, all great leaders in every walk of life are highly sex. And I've studied leadership in the Marine Corps. We had to study military leadership and political leadership. And in every instance, one of the things that I noticed that each one of these people were very highly sexed and had an amazing sex life when they were conquering, when they were really doing their thing. Uh, General Patton was such a foolish romantic. And I say foolish because he just, he did some, he made some, he did some crazy things based on the romanticisms of life. But he was a huge romantic. Um, but so many of these great military leaders and business leaders are highly sexed. He said, you know, Henry Ford, Carnegie, all of them. He said, but they follow the habit of controlling their sexual desires, switching them into a driving force behind their occupation. Now, we've also seen where this also destroys Bill Clinton. L let's compare Bill Clinton, Obama, Kennedy, John Kennedy. We see men with control over their sexual expression and they excel in life. We see Bill Clinton not control his sexual expression and look at what it did to his life. Look at the current president, President Trump. Look at what his uncontrolled sexual expression, yes, he won the presidency, but look at all the drama surrounding him based on sexual expression of grabbing him by the, you know, those sort of things. Control of your sexual expression. Look what happened to Bill Cosby. Once on top of the world, sexual expression uncontrolled, look what's happened to him now. Look at all these people who allowed for their, who, who were on top, who were controlling it to a certain degree. But then once the, the reality of their failures to control it came out, look at the damage it's done to them. But then look at the others. Look at your Samuel Jacksons. Look at some of these other people who have controlled it and not express it in negative forms, who haven't let it control them and their careers, their lives. Um, seems to be, be better. You have to know them in more detail in order to truly, truly know. But look at yourself. Look at yourself in that one. Um, but he said that sexual, that um, overindulgence in sex is as dangerous as narcotics and liquor. There's no difference between any of them. They create the habit of drifting. Um, so he says, um, Napoleon Hill said, do you mean by your own statement that one should not indulge in the, in the desire of sex? And he says, no, I mean that sex is like all other forces available to man. It should be understood and mastered and made to serve man. He said, you can no more kill the desire than you can stop a river from flowing. But if you do shut it off, abstinence, then just like a river, it will break free and flood the surrounding areas. If you dam up a river, it will flood the surrounding areas that you dammed it up. Unless you know how to release the pressure of the dam allow it to flow in a way that is beneficial to you. Then you can control it, you can create energy from it. Look at the Hoover Dam. It creates energy by controlling the flow of the Colorado River. I believe it's Colorado, but, but the Colorado River. It controls that energy. The more you control that energy, utilize it when necessary, express it when necessary, transmute that energy. If you watch my video on sexual alchemy, go back and watch my sexual alchemy video, you'll understand what I mean by controlling and transmuting that energy so that you manifest in life what it is you truly desire and you want to have manifested in your life. I'm gonna take a quick little pause and I'll be right back. As you guys know, I'm the owner of Uncle Ren's Popcorn, so I had to take a quick break to open the store as I was plan on ending this video at this point, but it's so good, I just had to keep going. Uh, so let's continue. This video is gonna be about maybe five, 10 more minutes long. So please bear with me, but I, I hope that you're gaining a lot from right now. I'm sure that you are. If you're not, you need to go back and start this video over and start over, all right? Um, so he, he then asked a very good question. He said, why does the world look upon sex as something vulgar? Now we can go very deep into this one all in itself, 
Um, but the simple answer is because of the vulgar abuse people have made of it, uh, made of this emotion. Uh, it is not sex that is vulgar. It is the individual who neglects to re or refuses to control it or guide it. Um, religion has made sex vulgar. Uh, society, no, societal norms have made it vulgar. At one point, the Kama Sutra is, well, it's not at one point, is, is written on the walls in India. But it was then only for the affluent, only for the, the royalty. But they expressed it in ways that showed that they didn't think it as vulgar. The Egyptians didn't think it as vulgar. So, you know, it, it became vulgar as the modern day religions began to take over and put their own stamps on it. And then also people began to make it vulgar. They began to utilize it in ways that were more harmful than they were good. They, were, um, they forgot how to transmute the energy of it and, and began to see it as just a lustful point. We, we downgrade it in our consciousness, which caused us, caused uh, generations and generations to be lost to this, to the vulgar parts of it, because we didn't know how to use it. Now he says later on, and I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna say this part now, but he says it later that the fact that nature, the creator, whichever you follow, utilize sex as the way to perpetuate the species and all species on the planet in itself should take away the vulgarness of it, because it is so natural, it is incredibly natural. But our usage of it is what has made it vulgar. So when people try to put limitations on it, who, should, who you should make love to. Now I do believe that it should be people who are of conscious mind, no children. It should be people who have made a decision to, to participate, no raping. It should be you know two consenting adults who decide that they're going to do it. And if those two, pe those two people decide that they're gonna do it, that's, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. If those three people, four people, I, there's no vulgarity to it, all right? And I know for some people, I'm gonna catch hell for that one, but I could care less because the fact of the matter is, is there is no vulgarity to it when it's used constructively, when it's used in a way that enhances your life, enhances your energy, allows you to have more control over your definiteness of purpose and your acting and gives you a discipline. You know, there, I was speaking to someone recently about the fact that, um, I was listening to the song, Cater to You. Well, the song was sent to me, Cater to You. And I was told by a friend that the only way that I'm going to be happy in a relationship is I have to find a woman who is strong enough to understand this song. And in listening to it intently for the first time, I realized there is an amazing amount of strength that it would take for a woman to be submissive to her husband. But that submission is not just submission and weakness. See, weakness in submission is when you're also jealous and insecure. But a strength in submission where you're not, where you're secure, you're not jealous. You protect the relationship and don't allow others to downgrade it, nor do you allow the opinions of others to downgrade your relationship. That you're strong enough to be able to do what's necessary and work on the relationship. We say it takes strength to build a company but I have to be submissive to my customers. I have to be submissive to the system that works, but I have to be strong enough to keep doing it, to protect it, to find someone in that position in a relationship. Whereas both people are truly being submissive to one another. I have to be submissive in the point where I learn how, I understand how to love and adore and adorn and care for and listen to and, and to that woman who is being that to me. Some people will only see the weakness in submission, not recognize that it takes more strength to be submissive and have a great relationship than it does to have a chip on your shoulder, to have egotism driving your relationship, to say that I'm gonna do it my way or it must be done this way or why can't you just accept however things go. Accepting how things go is drifting. I believe you create your relationships. You create the bond. You create the continuation of the relationship. Letting things just flow naturally is drifting. So, little side note there. <laughs> um, so where were we? I got thrown off on myself. 
All right, talked about the river overflowing, so it can overflow and, and fall into areas that are destructive if they're if it's left unchecked. If you try to, that, that's why I never believe in abstinence once you're an adult. Uh, and then I also don't believe that if you are you're using it in a control format, I do not get, give people the title of whore, slut, that sort of thing either. Now, if it's uncontrolled and it's just anybody, everybody, all the time, just that's all you're seeking, then you are a drifter and you are out of control. Um, but it destroys your it, when it's not enhanced. It destroys your enthusiasm. It destroys. It wastes all your energy. It, you don't maintain great physical, uh, great physical appearance. Your mannerism, your voice, your mind begins to get clouded. Whether you abstain from it or you overindulge, but when you don't, it's the reversal of these things. It sharpens your imagination. It guides you. It leads you. It helps you to master things like laziness and procrastination. It gives you, you know, more physical endurance. It is an antidote for your fear. An antidote for your fear. So. Mastering your sexual expression is vital for your success and that is probably the most difficult thing for to master in a Western culture because on one side there is the don't do it, it's so negative, it's so vulgar, you got to save yourself for the written petition of marriage, the contract of marriage, not the emotional, not the mental, not the spiritual, but the contract of marriage. But and, or, and then on the other side is overindulge, you know, all the time, every way in it, you know, just, just do it, do it, do it. You work for the sex, you live for the sex and it's overindulgence. So you have to find the balance. You see the Buddha, Sardatta, it is said that when he was a prince, him and his wife, that they made love so vigorously and so often that they was making love on the rooftop and fell off and didn't even realize it, that they were indulging in the pleasures of it to such a degree. But then when he became an ascetic, he abstained from it completely. No sex, no sex, no sex. Again, it wasn't until he found balance. It wasn't until he found balance that the Buddha mind, the title of Buddha could be bestowed upon him. And if you understood that more closely, then what you would know is in their system of understanding, the, the, the Hindu have a system of understanding. They have a, a, a caste system even in from, from the human, from the lower, lower level, to the human, to the angelic. But the Buddha, the Buddha head, the Buddha is higher than the angelic. When you've awakened, which is what the Buddha means, you've awakened, you're kind, you are higher than the angelic. All right, you're higher than what's the gods, the Kali's and, and the, the, all the other ones. You're higher when you reach that level. And remember the Buddhas came from the Hindu and then the Tao. So the next one is probably one that people don't pay attention to as much. And this is the expression of loosely loose opinions. This is the third appetite. Expressing your opinion without facts. When you don't have facts of things and you express an opinion, it is a belief, it is a hope, it is a wish. But oftentimes these things are done in such a way that people uh, destroy their credibility. It is not that you can't make a mistake. It is not that you can't say something today Find out facts tomorrow and change what you say. That is actually wisdom. That is actually wisdom. That is actually, if you go back to my video yesterday about the only thing you should be in love with is the pursuit of truth, not truth. Because when you love a truth, then you're stuck in love with that truth. But when you love a pursuit of truth, you're always opening and driving for the truth. Whether it's the same as it was yesterday or the next day, nothing all things we keep learning more things keep changing if you don't accept new facts then and, and if they can try to your old one then you are stuck you are finding your you you lose your definiteness of purpose you lose your pursuit of you become you fall into a hypnotic rhythm hence traditional religions nationalities race all these kind of things you lose because you're so focused on a truth not the pursuit of a truth so your loose opinions are based on a truth that you have said this this is the only truth um, so he he, uh, he talks about that uh, there's some more stuff about sexual expression I'm skipping through those but he says that when you do the loosely opinion then what you develop is called the grasshopper mind where you just you you just 
carelessly express different things, you fall into a hypnotic rhythm that prohibits you from accurately thinking. And because you are just skipping around and you lost your ability to accurately think, that is the most damaging thing to you. He goes into a lot of things about how the different, when you express yourself loosely and to editors and things like that, you're easy targets for scams, that you also, and Napoleon Hill lost a job opportunity because he you know, expressed himself loosely to an editor because you know, he was a writer. So he goes into different things like that. But the main thing I wanna focus on when it comes to expressing your loose, loose opinion is the fact that you lose your ability of accurate thinking. And when you lose your ability of accurate thinking, then you lose your ability, um, your freedom of thoughts. He says that there is, there is no human now, this is the devil, there is no human uh, now living, nor human being has ever lived, and no human being ever will live that doesn't have the right and the power, that has the right or the power to deprive another human being of their privilege of independent thought. You don't have the right. But then, he talks about uh, people working on the roof. No adult human being ever loses their right of freedom of thought, but most humans lose the benefit of this privilege either by neglect or because it has been taken away from them by their parents or religious instruction before they had came to the age of understanding. And that is the main thing about loosely loose opinions. You lose your ability to have freedom of thought. You give it away. You give away the privilege of it. You say that it's not, you, you let other people control it. Now many have lost it because of parents, because of how you grew up, but that doesn't have to be so. You don't have to lose it that way. You have to gain it back. And we're going to continue on these. Um, I appreciate everybody for being here. I know this video went way longer than I expected, but it's such a good one. It's going to be posted everywhere. Continue to support the channel. Join us on Patreon. And I appreciate you guys for being here. So remember, you have to free yourself to be yourself because your greatness is non-negotiable.